Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Zero Emissions Solution Conference. Now we will begin the panel on Southeast Asia. The formal title is ASEAN's Green Future, Further, Faster, Together. I think that we should add another word to further and faster. And that important word is cheaper. ASEAN can decarbonize together cheaper because there are considerable economies of scale involved. For example, when it is not a good idea for every country to be self-sufficient in renewable energy because of the intermittent nature of solar power and wind power. So a regional national electric grid is or provides reliability by connecting all the national networks. For example, the hydropower of Laos could be mobilized in Cambodia if, the, if it were a rainy day in Cambodia for that particular period. Similarly, a high-speed electric train system could repeat much of the travel by plane within the region. For example, from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, from Kuala Lumpur to Bangkok, Bangkok to Phnom Penh, Bangkok to uh, Ventian. Those would certainly be much greener than uh, the, the use of airplanes, which, would, which are more unlikely to be electric in the near future. Of course, in the long run, we may be able to fuel airplanes with green hydrogen, but the technology is not here yet. So the ASEAN Green Future Project started earlier this year involving a group of ASEAN con uh, country teams from ASEAN countries. Today, we have five of the teams to present their work on this project to date. The first speaker is Professor Aline Halima Tusa, who is the Head of Environmental Economics at the University of Indonesia in Jakarta. Ibu Alin, good morning. Uh, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Then let's start. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Wing, for your kind introduction. Uh, good day, all. It's a pleasure for me representing Indonesia team and share my uh, thoughts uh, about uh, the progress of Indonesia's climate agenda and uh, how we can move further uh, to achieve a more ambitious climate target. Uh, next, please. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I would like to talk about climate exposure in Indonesia, current status of emission, and what has been done in Indonesia, mostly in terms of planning. Uh, next is about the recent trends reflecting higher national interest to achieve more ambitious climate target uh, and how we can gain multiple benefit uh, from pursuing uh, stronger, stronger climate action. Lastly, I would like to give some highlights on key recommendation for Indonesia as well as for cooperation among uh, ASEAN countries. Next, please. So Indonesia is an archipelagic uh, country uh, and quite vulnerable to climate change. We are also exposed uh, to climate-related disaster such as droughts, floods, and landslide. With poverty rate more than 10% and poor people mostly work in agricultural and fishery sectors, the societal impact of climate change can be considered as uh, significant. With large population and large scale of economy, Indonesia become the world top five emitter. 
and land sectors and energy in this case are two most important sectors for emission reduction. Indonesia aims to escape from middle income trap by 2045. We want to achieve at least five uh, or six percent of GDP growth per year and income per capita of uh, 23,000 uh, USD for more than uh, 300 million people. So without proper mitigation measures, Indonesia could contribute significantly to climate change and global warming. Next, please. So land use become the first driver of emission followed by energy. Uh, but in the near future, energy sector will exceed the contribution of land sectors. However, land use sectors is important because it has important role uh, as the carbon sink. Uh, the government planning to reduce emission has been stated in several documents. The first one uh, is in 2011, uh, we want to reduce emission 26% uh, from uh, the business as usual level by 2020. And this plan has been updated uh, by the Indonesia's NDC to reduce emission by 29% from the business as usual level by 2030. Uh, the current national Devel medium development uh, plan or RPJMN is considered as green development planning because uh, for this planning, Indonesia has put climate, disaster, and environmental issues as national priorities. Later on, uh, the Ministry of National Development Planning also launched LCDI document, which elaborates strategies to achieve low carbon development in Indonesia. Next. Uh, an evaluation has been made by Climate Action Tracker regarding Indonesia's commitment on climate target and action. They rated Indonesia's ambition as highly insufficient and too far to meet the Paris Agreement target. Another problem occurs related to uh, financing needs. We still need funding uh, tripled from what has been allocated today to achieve NDC's target. There has been an initiative uh, from the financial service regulator to implement sustainable financing since 2014. However, uh, due to some problems such as shallow financial market and unfamiliarity of financial institution to green sectors, uh, this made the financing from the private sectors is not optimal yet. Therefore, uh, the role of international finance is important uh, to overcome the financing problem. Next. Uh, based on the assessment on the climate target, climate action implementation, and also the current trend of global climate target, Indonesia has initiated to pursue more ambitious climate target. First, uh, just several months ago, Indonesia launched long-term strategies on lo low carbon and climate resilience that set emission reduction target by uh, 2050. The target is much more aggressive than what has been stated in the NDC. Uh, the LTS LCCR also mentioned about the intention of Indonesia to achieve net zero emission by 2060 or sooner. Second, the National Development Planning Agency has prepared four scenarios of N uh, NZT or net zero emission that uh, two scenarios are faster than 2060. Although this is just initial assessment and not a legal binding document, it could be a good sign of the possibility that Indonesia could achieve net zero emission faster than 2060. Uh, the third one, uh, a new regulation of carbon tax just launched. Uh, starting 1 April 2022, carbon tax with a cap will be imposed to coal fired power plant with the rate of uh, 2.1 USD per ton. Uh, CO2. And the last one, uh, I think we need to appreciate some local initiative. Some region already implemented ecological fiscal transfer, which incentivizes local government to improve their environmental performance and rewarded uh, through fiscal transfer. Next. So we can see from this uh, diagram, in the LTS LCCR, there are three scenarios. The first one, CPOS is the scenario of business as usual, or if we extrapolate NDC until 2050. 
the, we can see that the emission trajectory will be higher over time and we cannot see the trend of emission reduction. What we want to achieve is the scenario of, of our LCCP with the result of much lower net emission by 2050 and hopefully become net zero by 2060 or sooner. We can see here that the role of energy sectors, the black one, is very important. However, we cannot achieve net zero emission without the role of forestry sectors and also land use that function as the carbon sink and make the net zero possible. Next, please. So uh, ongoing discussion regarding pursuing uh, stronger climate targets is whether we can achieve higher GDP and absorb employment. In the LCDI document, uh, the document present that we can achieve multiple economic benefit from low carbon development. The most optimistic scenario uh, shows that the growth rate uh, is the highest compared to other scenarios and generate a minimum un unemployment rate. Next, please. So this report provides several recommendations. At the regional level, we see that uh, the strategic uh, Indonesia uh, have the strategic, strategic position. In 2022, Indonesia will hold G20 presidency, and in the following year, year uh, we'll hold ASEAN presidency. And with this role, Indonesia can initiate and take leadership among ASEAN countries in several issues. The recommendation for collaboration among ASEAN countries are not limited to climate action, but also incorporate broader environmental issue. Two more first, minutes. Okay, thank you, Prof. Wing. Uh, first, uh, to set more ambitious emission reduction target and ensuring every Asian countries has net zero emission plan that includes phasing out coal target. Second one, the, to adopt sustainable, fisher, uh, sustainable fisheries management. Third one, mainstreaming circular economy. Fourth, enhancing global value chain for green transportation and other green sectors. And the last one is to continue effort to implement ASEAN for a grid to expand multilateral electricity trading in the region and build a stronger capacity to absorb renewable energy. Aline, I was wrong. You have four more minutes. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was wrong. Uh, I one last slide. <laughs> okay. Uh, and at the national level, Indonesia should publicly declare more ambitious climate target, followed by sound and coherent policies. Some critical points are the phasing out coal program, ensuring just transition, mobilizing domestic and international financing to solve the climate financing gap. The last one is technology adoption and market development, which need regional and international collaboration. Uh, thank you uh, for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Prof. Ng. I will give back to you. Thank you, Professor Alin. That was a very good uh, presentation. That's now that we have a good start. I would like to uh, remind members of the audience that when you have questions, please put them in the Q and A box at the bottom of the right hand side, and during the questions and answer time, I will uh, read your question for from the from that box and ask the the speakers to answer. Our next speaker is Ms. Dr. Uh, Pisaf Kio of the Center of Sustainable Development at the Asian Vision Institute in Phnom Penh. Professor. Uh, uh, Dr. Kyo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Wing. Um, could I uh, share the screen? Sorry, uh, could you see? Uh, um, let me try to share the screen again. Yes, thank you. And. <laughs> Once again, thank you for the floor, Professor Wing, and uh, thank you, <laughs> distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to do the uh, presentation on the uh, report uh, from Cambodia on Cambodia Pass toward decarbonization by 2050. Um, you may want to move closer to the mic. 
Okay. Yep. Uh, it's a collaboration between the uh, Asian Vision Institute, which is the uh, Cambodia-based uh, think tank, in collaboration with the um, with the uh, Sustainable Development Solutions uh, Network, and also Climate Work Australia, as already uh, mentioned, with the projects here. And so, this uh, uh, presentations I will uh, for this report I will focus on the uh, start with the introduction to Cambodia and the Cambodian climate response and outlook for greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the potential for decarbonization by 2050 and potential benefit and potential risks that Cambodia uh, do not take. And this one is also, uh, if Cambodia do not take, and it also have implication for the regional, uh, regional level as well. And so uh, please allow me to introduce you to Cambodia. It's uh, one of South Asia country. They have, uh, we have a border with uh, Vietnam to the right, um, uh, to the east, and uh, border with Laos and uh, Thailand and the Gulf of Thailand. And the population of uh, Cambodia is uh, uh, more than 15 million people. Uh, the land uh, size is 181,035 kilometers square. And for the economies, uh, we made, a, uh, Cambodia made a, a good uh, progress annually uh, ground and average uh, 8% uh, from 1998 to 2018. So we, the economy have grown from 244 per capita to 1,721 uh, US dollar per capita um, in 2021. And it's contracted, the economy contracted due to the impact of the COVID-19 in 2019 and 2020. And it, it expected uh, to increase in uh, 2021, and the and uh, uh, and the share uh, the economy slightly depends on the uh, agriculture service uh, uh, industry and service the uh, service sector uh, share large proportion, followed by industry and agriculture. And uh, for Cambodia, despite the fact that Cambodia was one of the least uh, developing country, Cambodia have been actively participated in international negotiations uh, in the uh, United Nations framework. Uh, convention uh, framework on climate change based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. And Cambodia joined the uh, UNFCC in 1995 uh, and uh, Kyoto Protocol in 2002 and also signed the Paris Agreement in uh, 2016. And they also sent the first national communications, uh, second national uh, communication, and uh, third uh, national communication being prepared and also submitted the uh, national determined contribution in 2020. And Cambodia was also preparing long-term strategy uh, uh, for decommunization by the mid-century as well. And also uh, beside it, uh, for this international uh, uh, participation, Cambodia have also built institutions for climate response and mainstream climate uh, change mitigation into national policy and subnational policy, uh, uh, subnational development plan as well. And we also have a uh, public investment. And uh, Cambodia have also uh, uh, piloted a number of projects on a uh, uh, clean uh, development mechanism. And we also have Cambodia uh, strategic uh, climate change plans and green growth development plans and uh, green growth roadmap and other uh, plans that are being in place. So, uh, uh, so allow me to go to the uh, outlook for Cambodia. Even uh, climate change mitigation is uh, voluntary, as one uh, the same, same to other least developing countries. But Cambodia have uh, 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 actively participate uh, in for the greenhouse gas mitigations. And so, the uh, in early 1990, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation for Cambodia was le uh, relatively low at about uh, 42. Uh, about 42 megatons and it have increased uh, uh, triples over the uh, uh, two de uh, more than two decades and, and and look at the data on the 2016 when it conducted the uh, for the national determined contributions uh, the forest and land use change um, share around 61 uh, percent while the culture was um, around 16.9 uh, and the energy was 12 uh, percent. And so the forest, uh, forest and land use and agriculture share like uh, like proportions, and and it is expected uh, expected that by 2030 the energy will overtake agriculture uh, sector with the uh, increased uh, consumption of uh, energy consumption for 
uh, manufacturing, commercials and residential buildings, uh, transportation, and for many other uh, uh, energy-based uh, subsectors. So um, with this, uh, without the uh, uh, with the business as usual, it is expected uh, Cambodia will uh, produce around uh, 155 megatons. But with the intervention under the national determined contributions, it is expected uh, it will uh, would reduce 42% of greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, the uh, forest and land use uh, largely responsible uh, is the key sectors in Cambodia for greenhouse gas emissions. So the intervention would uh, focus on uh, forest and land use change. And of course, even the uh, energy is take only uh, about 20%, but it's still uh, large. Uh, and it also requires a lot of uh, attention. And uh, Cambodian uh, government have uh, and work with the international donor and private sector to induce different schemes for, uh, uh, for the uh, energy, renewable energy, renewable and clean energy for energy sectors, and all, as well as other sectors to uh, mitigate greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. And if you look at this, this is the estimate by the, one of the researchers. So uh, once again, this research is based on literature review uh, produced by the government uh, commitment uh, and, uh, and also by the independent researcher. Uh, with the estimate, uh, uh, this researcher uh, do the estimate for the 2030 uh, with business as uh, usual and also potential uh, mitigation actions. And at the same time, we also propose, uh, propose for the potential mit, uh, mitigation potential by 2050. So with the, the estimate, uh, uh, in forest uh, land use remain the largest sector uh, up until 2050, even though the uh, share of energy sector uh, will largely increase. And with the interventions uh, for the potential mitigation, uh, a potential it can reduce up to 72 percent uh, so 72.5 uh, percent uh, if action uh, uh, implemented and so what are the potential actions uh, as uh, i already mentioned forest and land use uh, is one of the uh, key sectors that emit uh, greenhouse gas into the atmosphere so reducing historical forest loss and maintaining 60 percent of the forest cover uh, based on the sustainable forest management and rehabilitation uh, would help a lot as the forest can uh, play a role for as a carbon sink and also it reduces its emission to, uh, of the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And for energy sector, we can also increase the shares of renewable energy into the energy mix and electri uh, electrifying uh, and use and improving energy efficiencies. Uh, these are just some of the uh, propo proposals and they are also detailed uh, activity that can be applied. And for agriculture, sustainable agricultural practice and land management, bioregistering plan, construction for methane, capture and deep, uh, replacement fertilizer technology are some of the intervention that can, uh, could be in the use. And, uh, uh, and same goes to the uh, IPPU, industrial process, uh, the carbon capture and storage from cement production and shifting from uh, fossil fuels and improving energy efficiency in uh, production process would help. And for waste, we usually uh, talk about reduce, uh, reduce recycle, but we can also have the idea of this thing, reuse and repair as well, uh, which would uh, likely reduce the amount of waste being uh, discharged into the landfill. And we can also introduce landfill methane capture and oxidation and promotion of circular economies and improvement of, improvement of waste, uh, wastewater treatment and composting facility. So, and these are the interventions that could be implemented uh, in various uh, components of uh, uh, sectors. And actually, it, uh, and also they are a subsector uh, in that. And so uh, what are the potential benefits uh, with that, uh, with a range of uh, interventions and also the consideration for decarbonization by 2050 or uh, 2060, depending on the situation that we set on the evaluation. Uh, Estimate for 2050, it will enable Cambodia continued transformation toward a sustainable, resilient, and clean and green society through the uh, protection of the forest and as well as a cleaner uh, and renewable energy, which reduce the uh, air pollution. And with that, a, a range of in a, uh, a, a range of intervention for greenhouse gas mitigation, it also provides co-benefit for economy, the environment, and society, and it will have 
achieve various targets of sustainable development as a development goal as well. If you look at the economic sector, it, uh, we can look at the in terms of employment in forest sector, employment in, uh, in ecotourism uh, sector, or the uh, local livelihood who depend on uh, what uh, on uh, forest resources. Or we can talk about the transition uh, of employment from the renewable energy to renewable energies, or uh, honeybee uh, forest production uh, uh, product, for example, honeybee collection and production. They are all the benefit that can uh, we uh, we can all uh, way get from the uh, uh, the transition toward more cleaner and greener uh, economy. And for environment, there are huge benefit from forest. Uh, uh, ecosystem services. If you look at uh, in terms of water, uh, water uh, treatment, we look at on the uh, pollinations, and um, also uh, if you look at uh, renewable energies, it uh, cleaner airs uh, for and reduce uh, pollutions. And also also for social and culture, it's eco therapy. Uh, people need forest uh, more, need more nature. They need to they need to stay close to the forest. Uh, to nature when the uh, uh, lifestyle in the urban area is being uh, they are being affected by the lifestyle in the urban areas so these are the benefit that you can um, uh, name it that there are huge and a wide range of benefit that can be uh, calculated uh, from uh, a range of sectors and also we there's an opportunity for financial and technical support and uh, technology uh, technology Trends as well as well from the international development partners and as well as uh, private sectors. And uh, for the uh, potential risk, if uh, Cambodia do not uh, prepare well, and of course, then Cambodia. Two more minutes. Yep, uh, we'll uh, finish soon. Uh, Cambodia will miss the uh, opportunity to adapt or uh, be inundated with the stranded uh, fossil fuel assets and face demands uh, pressure from international market as well as a major economy, including the Euro European Union, China, uh, United States of America, India, and others are looking to work more to commit uh, to uh, decarbonization by 2050 or 2016. And Cambodia for next year, Cambodia is the chairman of ASEAN. It's also the, a good opportunity for Cambodia to uh, uh, highlight, uh, to uh, uh, focus, uh, to commit more into uh, work to bring uh, to collaborate with other country uh, as I mentioned by a previous presenter uh, to discuss about ASEAN uh, decarbonization by the mid century so that pretty much uh, the end of my presentation thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you dr Kiel. that was a very good ending with uh, an outstanding ending with people standing straight up <laughs> so let's come to the third uh, oh, before I introduce the next speaker, I'd like to tell the audience that SDSN has just posted a web link in the chat box that would take you to some of the reports that have been prepared for this project. So look at, and the other thing is, if you have questions, please write them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of the right hand side. Our third speaker is Professor Popet Kofi Lavong, the Dean of the School of Economics at National Lao University. Welcome Popet. So let's begin. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor Wu for introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It is my great honor to give the presentation of the carbonization in Lao, the option and challenge on behalf of the Lao team. Um, as the Cambodia team already mentioned, that Lao is next to uh, near the Cambodia. It is very beautiful, uh, small Southeast Asian country with uh, only 7 million population. Uh, before the COVID pandemic, the economic growth is relative high, it's allowed 7% per year. But unfortunately, due to the impact of the COVID-19, uh, economic growth is suffering a lot. 
allow him to escape from LDC uh, and to the sustainable uh, development goal, uh, reducing the poverty and protecting environment. And the reducing the CO2 emission is also the main uh, key priority of the Lao government. In order to do that, Lao have the national strategy on climate change, uh, climate change action plan, and green growth strategy. And Lao also submit the NDC to the UN in 2015. As you see that the CO2 emission in Laos have been increasing quite significantly since 2000. And the most, the highlight share is, is from the transportation park. And if you look at the, the consumption, energy consumption, it is also increased uh, quite high. And to cope with this, uh, the energy supply in Laos is also increased. This is mainly from the hydropower and uh, coal and another. For the electricity balance, um, the Laos is the net export electricity to our neighboring country. Uh, to we export electricity which generate from the hydropower plant to the Thailand and uh, Cambodia. And we also planning to, to sell electricity to Vietnam in the near future. For the reduction uh, CO2 emission plant in Laos, uh, we have six activity that the plan that government setting up one is to implement the forestry strategy. Uh, second is renewable energy development strategy. And the third is implement of the LULO electrification program. And fourth is uh, the transportation program. And then the, the large scale hydroelectric city. And the last one is, is about the implement climate change action program. That is the plan to uh, of the Lao government want to reduce the CO2 emission. Now, when we look at the current compare the plan to to reality, what they, we can achieve, if uh, in the six sector six plan only the implementation of Lulo electrification program can achieve, uh, we can achieve ninety percent. Uh, of the household can access to electricity. In another sector, we still facing the quite challenge, could not achieve well. Okay. <clears throat> now, the Lao government used the simulation model from UNEP DTU to simulate the impact of the, uh, the scenario. We uh, choose the data from many sources. We can see that in the baseline scenario, the business as the usual. And second scenario is unconditional mitigation scenario. This means that the Lao government using their own budget and uh, existing support from the developing developed country. And the last scenario is the conditional mitigation scenario. That means that uh, we get more support from developing country. Um, from the list out, we see that if we don't do nothing, surely that CO2 emission is increased significantly. And if even though there exist condition, unconditioned mitigation scenario, the law can reduce uh, CO2 emission in compared to the bed line 2020. But if the, the last one, the conditional uh, scenario, that this means that get more support from the developing country, uh, the CO2 emission might go to uh, zero in 2050. That 
However, is this the similar uh, simulation uh, model? Is this based on many assumptions and parameter and to estimate that? Uh, in fact, now we have number of challenging that we need to address. Uh, for the, the challenge in implementation of NDC, as the Department of the Climate Change from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment is in charge in the coordinating this. However, uh, they have number of challenges, including lack of coordination and capacity and financing is also the challenge. And they're also facing the problem with the data, accuracy and availability. That, that, that is uh, quite challenge. And for the list, the key list for uh, financing and investment for um, the, the key growth opportunity for our economic growth and reducing CO2 emission is the hydro power electric city. The Lao government follow the model of build, operate and transfer. Therefore, they have number of the foreign direct investment come to invest in this sector in Laos. However, we facing some risk of the climate change. The landfall have been declining with lead due to lower level of electricity generation. That is also the quite um, challenging, the risk in, in, in this sector. Another List for the delay, as the, um, I mentioned before that uh, we have the finance and human capital availability, availability are also the list to achieving the target. In addition, uh, the market incentive and tune to involve private and consumer uh, to reduce the CO2 emission are not in place. Until now, we don't have uh, tax subsidy financial incentive to reducing the CO2 emission yet. And uh, in addition, as I mentioned before, we are facing the budget deficit and the quite debt uh, burden. <clears throat> and I have the key recommendation that uh, from our study, um, the Lao have commit to agenda of the UNFCCC to reduce CO2 emission. This is the priority of the Lao government. However, we facing many, many challenges. And the key recommendation for overcome that challenges are uh, to improve institutional mechanism for uh, monitoring and reporting NDC implementation to stand the government structure and in institutional environment is it. And the next is improve capacity of government and staff in national level and uh, regional uh, provincial level is also very uh, key, important key. And to improve the data accuracy, availability and transparency also very important uh, when we um, is the key. And also the finance to support the funding and finance for NDC implementation. Uh, the last one is, is the coordination between the donor uh, also more effectively. This is also really uh, um, important for, uh, for Laos. That, that is my end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Your mic is mute, Professor. Uh, I, I'm sorry that uh, we in the third world are, con are used to being voiceless, but I, I'll tr try to make up for it in this session. Thank you for your very last slide, which really show the range of cultural diversity here in Southeast Asia. 
now we will come to the presenter from Malaysia, Professor Leong Yun Yong of the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development at Sunway University in Kuala Lumpur. Professor Leong, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Wu. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Team Malaysia, which has 10 members, completed the Options for Decarbonizing Malaysia report in June. Five months have come to pass, and thinking has evolved. Today's sharing lays out the current state of thinking and the questions that require further consideration. We hope to receive your feedback and guidance. Team Malaysia has researched eight sectors in the ASEAN Green Future Project at the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development at Sunway University. We will discuss three topics today, green energy, sustainable agriculture, and blue carbon ecosystems. Number one, green energy. In September this year, at the unveiling of the 12th Malaysia Plan, Prime Minister Ismail Sabri announced Malaysia's commitment to become carbon neutral as early as 2050. To substantially decarbonize the Malaysian economy, the power sector has a crucial role to play. In Malaysia, natural gas and coal contribute to more than 80% of the power generation mix. The government targets renewable energy to constitute 31% of installed power generation capacity in 2035 and 40% in, 20, in 2035. Note that these numbers are installed capacity. There is a crucial difference between installed capacity and electricity generation for intermittent renewable energy sources like solar and biomass because they are not constantly available. The ratio between these two numbers is called the capacity factor, and it is less than one. Solar, hydro, biomass, and biogas offer a greener energy future, but are unlikely to be enough to completely decarbonize the grid in the near term. By 2030, around 1,250 gigawatts of coal power plants worldwide that are currently in operation or under construction could not only still be in service, but could also still have a remaining lifetime of at least 20 years. Since Malaysia and many developing Southeast Asian countries remain heavily reliant on coal and natural gas as fuel sources, we need to think about stepping stones to cross the great decarbonization river. Ammonia does not emit carbon dioxide when burned and is a viable alternative fuel in thermal power generation. Coal firing green ammonia at commercial coal fired plants can reduce carbon emissions and mitigate their risk of becoming stranded assets before their average lifespan of almost 50 years is up. Therefore, green ammonia can be part of Malaysia's move to reach net 
zero carbon emissions. It may not be the final answer, and it does not need to be. It is something in the right direction that on the one hand buys time, and on the other develops determined action in the right direction. In February this year, Japan's largest power generation company, Jera, signed an MOU with Petronas to use renewable energy to produce green ammonia, which would, which would be used in an experiment of mixing coal and ammonia as fuel in a thermal power plant in Japan. Three months later, JERA announced a four-year test project from 2021 to 2025 aimed at an eventual ammonia coal firing rate of 20% from 2024 onwards. In the same month, the Japanese government announced public and private investment and loan facility of up to 10 billion US dollars to accelerate decarbonization in ASEAN countries through the Asia Energy Transition Initiative. One of the aims of AETI is to encourage adoption of ammonia coal firing technology in coal fired plants. What is the near term global relevance of this stepping stone? Coal firing with a 20% share of low carbon ammonia could reduce the six gigatons carbon dioxide emissions per year of coal power plants worldwide by 1.2 gigatons. Reaching a 20% blending share would result in an annual ammonia demand of 670 million metric tons, which is more than three times today's global ammonia production. Bringing our attention back to Malaysia, Sarawak has immense hydro resources to produce green hydrogen, which is a building block for green ammonia. POSCO, Lotte Chemical, Sarawak Economic Development Corporation and Samsung Engineering have set out last month to develop a green hydrogen and ammonia project in Bintulu. The project is expected to produce 7,000 metric tons of green hydrogen, 600,000 metric tons of blue ammonia, 630,000 metric tons of green ammonia and 460,000 metric tons of green methanol per annum. Looking around at our ASEAN neighbours, Vietnam, which has a coastline of more than 3,000 kilometres and located in the monsoonal climate zone, has excellent wind resource that has attracted global investment interest. However, due to insufficient grid infrastructure, solar and wind farms in Vietnam have faced power grid curtailment as renewable energy build-ups expand. Instead of letting curtailment affect the bankability of renewable energy projects, the energy that cannot be absorbed by the grid can be directed to produce green hydrogen and green ammonia. Green hydrogen can enable deep decarbonization of transportation, industry and power. Malaysia and ASEAN countries should use our advantage in renewable energy generation to develop higher value green industries and supply chains and not rest on the laurels 
of exporting green hydrogen and green ammonia to Japan. The cost of green hydrogen is set to decline rapidly. The Indian conglomerate Reliance Industries has just signed a deal with wind power pioneer Stiesda to mass produce an ultra low cost electrolyzer that will bring hydrogen energy to under $1 per kilo within a decade. What can Malaysia and ASEAN countries learn from Japan's ambition to create a global supply chain of ammonia for use as fuel and their aim to increase Japan's annual ammonia fuel demand through 3 million metric tons by 2030, up from zero from now. Ladies and gentlemen, the second topic is sustainable agriculture. The 12th Malaysia plan identifies soil fertility as one of the ecosystem health indicators to be closely monitored and recommends more collaboration with universities on soil testing. The 12th Malaysia plan should have also pinpointed soil fertility as a lever for agriculture productivity and decarbonization. Malaysia manufactures and uses chemical fertilizer at 10 times the rate of application of many neighboring ASEAN countries, but achieves a lower agricultural yield than them. The very poor fertility of Malaysia's soil is the reason. The excessive use of fertilizer has seriously damaged the microbiological ecosystem that is the soil's fertility. What is needed is a biological solution based on a thorough understanding of the underlying microbiological ecosystem and working to regenerate it. Industrial farming makes monoculture plantations vulnerable to climate impacts. To improve agriculture's resilience to extreme weather, science-based composting and other soil fertility and reaching techniques need to be adopted. Malaysia's agriculture carbon footprint will also reduce when less chemical fertilizer is used. It is critical for policymakers to shift their mindset to treat soil as a living being and feed it appropriately so that the symbiotic relationships between microbes and plants can always be vibrant. Then they will be able to shift federal agriculture investments to One nurture moment. this productive capital asset and develop good farming practice. Despite its dirt-like image, soil is a living entity and human beings need to learn about it as we are learning about life below water, SDG 14, and life on land, SDG 15. Life in soil is largely micro microbial and should be highlighted by the United Nations as SDG 18. Ladies and gentlemen, decarbonization frameworks need to go beyond policies and technical fixes. The 12th Malaysia Plan rightly urges a mindset change and people's behavioral shift for green growth. Only then can Malaysia forge a green developmental path that is different from the economic gospel of valuing only consumption and inspire ASEAN and the world on how to achieve full human lives using less material. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Team Malaysia's decarbonisation research also covers topics like transportation, manufacturing and construction, oil and gas, waste, forestry and coral reefs. My colleagues will present their work to you on another occasion. Back to you, Professor Wu. Thank you, Professor Leong. Uh, I would like to remind the audience to put their questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the right-hand side. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Megan Argrio, uh, head of the Department of International and Country Contacts at Climate Works Australia, which is a research unit of Monash University in Melbourne. Welcome from down under, Megan. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Wu. Uh, just bear with me for a moment while I share my screen. Oh, hang on. Okay, and then... <laughs> Hopefully this will work. I should be I should be better at technology by now. I have to say, after um, so long in um, in lockdown using Zoom. Okay, can everybody see that? Thumbs up. Can you see my presentation? Yes. I'm yes. Assuming. Yes. Yes. Come to cross. Thank you. Good. Good. Okay, um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, a regional report that we prepared as part of the ASEAN Green Future Project. Uh, uh, so this uh, drew on the excellent work that you've heard about uh, today from some of the country teams uh, and supplemented that with uh, you know, a review of literature focused um, at a regional level. Um, and so we're calling that report the Agenda for Decarbonisation and it should be published uh, within the next week or so. Um, so I'm just going to sort of start by getting a little bit of context and, and I'm sure that everyone on this call is aware uh, that we are in a growing global emergency. I think that's very, very clear both uh, in terms of the increasing uh, focus uh, you know, on the COP26 process, but also in the very real effects uh, that, that everyone is uh, feeling. Um, and the risks of exceeding 1.5 degrees are increasingly recognised as being unacceptable. Um, but fortunately, the world, I hope, is at a tipping point in terms of climate action. You know, there, there is this real sense that momentum is growing. Um, and we've now got 136 countries that have made a pledge to net zero emissions. Uh, and really, really excitingly, just in the last couple of days, we've seen uh, commitments come from both Thailand and Vietnam. Uh, who were joining other our other ASEAN, uh, their other ASEAN neighbours, Laos and Malaysia, who also have 2050 net zero 2050 commitments, uh, Indonesia, who currently has a net zero by 2060 commitment, and Singapore with a net zero as soon as possible in the second half of the century commitment. Um, but you know, I think I think it's really fantastic to see uh, incredibly positive momentum in the ASEAN region, uh, and being an Australian. I hope that my government is feeling a little bit of pressure from its neighbours to step up uh, and put a bit more meat on the bones of its own commitments. Um, and you know what we've seen from the work of the IEA released this year is that achieving net zero uh, in the global energy sector, sector is both achievable and socioeconomically desirable. Uh, in fact, it would uh, deliver increased global GDP. Um, and the role of the energy sector is critically important, of course, in staying below 1.5 degrees, uh, but the goals of the Paris Agreement can't be achieved without significant contributions from the land sector as well, uh, which could in fact contribute 25% of the emissions reductions that are needed. And the ASEAN region has a really critical role to play in global climate action. So it's fantastic to see um, the, the region really embracing uh, that, that challenge with its bold commitments. Um, and we're seeing, in addition to the net zero uh, targets, we're seeing really positive examples um, from within the region. 
uh, ambitious re renewable energy deployment. Um, you know, in the case of Vietnam, uh, which has installed a whopping 16 gigawatts of uh, rooftop solar PV in less than a year. It's just astonishing. Um, and we're also seeing an increasing focus on uh, things like energy efficiency, really important, as well as some high impact initiatives to reduce uh, uh, emissions from deforestation, such as those that we've seen uh, work really effectively in the case of Indonesia and Malaysia. Yet emissions in the region are amongst the fastest growing in the world. And in contrast to global trends, coal use is expected to continue to rise over the next 20 years under a business as usual scenario. And overall energy related emissions are predicted to almost double by 2040. Uh, and land based emissions uh, can't be forgotten. They are in fact the largest overall share of emissions today um, in the ASEAN region. And this is driven in large part by deforestation uh, and then things like peatland degradation uh, and agriculture, such as uh, rice production, which, um, which produces a lot of methane emissions. And this has caused, uh, so what we've seen actually in the region is over the last 20 years or so that the, the, um, the region's forests have shifted from being a net sink of, um, of carbon to a net source of emissions. And of course, not surprisingly, uh, emissions growth in the region has been closely uh, tied to development gains. We've seen really fantastic uh, improvements in poverty in the region over the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, you know, and, and that's been incredibly, incre incredibly positive developments. Um, but we've also seen as a cause of the pandemic that a huge number of people, tens of millions of people have been pushed back into extreme poverty in the region. Uh, and those, the development gains uh, are also reflected in the region's increasing economic strength. ASEAN um, has, you know, really good trade relations and increasing economic clout um, as a trading bloc and privileged access to some of the world's largest economies through those trade relations. And when you couple that with its geographical location, sort of in the, as a trade hub in the heart of the Indo-Pacific region, um, Indonesia's, or sorry, ASEAN's ability to fully capitalise on the trade opportunities that can come with the low carbon transition uh, will depend on how it responds to the global, trans the global transition itself. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it's, a, it's particularly acute that the risk of delaying climate action in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, far outweigh any perceived benefits of, of delay. We have six of the world's top 20 most vulnerable countries uh, to the impacts of climate change in Southeast Asia. And uh, climate impacts, of course, uh, equals economic impacts. And global reinsurer Swiss Ray uh, earlier this year offered a pretty stark assessment when they found that the ASEAN economy could lose 37.4% of GDP by 2048 due to the impacts of climate change. And further economic impacts could also come about through things like trade penalties uh, from key trade partners, uh, it's, you know, that are such as the European Union who are implementing their carbon border adjustment mechanism, but also other key trade partners who implement uh, carbon pricing in future. But fortunately, the pathway uh, to stabilise global temperature emissions below 1.5 degrees is well understood. Uh, so it's excellent that we've seen uh, net zero commitments coming from the region. Uh, the effort now is on ensuring that those net zero commitments are consistent with the global trajectory for 1.5 degrees. And um, in terms of how we decarbonise, the, there's kind of four basic pillars, um, you know, and it, 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 these apply regardless of the country, regardless of the um, sector, uh, even they can even be applied at a, at a um, corporate level, for example. There's sort of four areas uh, to focus decarbonisation efforts and they will apply to greater or lesser extent, depending on the emissions profile of the country or region. Um, so the first pillar focuses on decarbonising electricity generation. Um, so shifting from coal-fired power, power to clean energy uh, generation, such as renewable energy. And, um, you know, the renewable energy potential across ASEAN still remains largely untapped. Uh, renewable energy is currently meeting just 15% of the region's uh, energy demand. 
The second pillar focuses on shifting uh, from fossil fuels to electricity or other clean energy alternatives. So things like electrifying transport, uh, and, you know, there's really fantastic momentum already in ASEAN around transport electrification, uh, you know, both as a way to improve uh, fuel security, also as a way to uh, minimise some of the air pollution issues and health outcomes that come from that and also, you know, delivers a really strong uh, climate mitigation outcome as well. Um, and shifting from fossil fuels to clean energy sources also includes things such as green hydrogen, which uh, Dr. Leon spoke about so eloquently. Um, and, you know, and as she described, the region has really excellent uh, renewable potential to, to boost its uh, ca uh, capabilities in the production of green hydrogen. The third pillar focuses on uh, reducing energy waste in buildings, transport and industrial sectors. So energy efficiency, essentially. Um, and we've seen a huge increase in energy demand across the ASEAN region, 60% uh, over the last 15 years, uh, expected to increase by a further 60% out to 2040. And so energy efficiency is a, is a really key way to address that growing demand um, rather than investing in much more expensive energy infrastructure. And then the fourth pillar of decarbonisation focuses on preserving and increasing natural carbon sinks. Uh, so protecting and restoring the region's forests, including peatlands. Um, uh, we've also, um, we've also uh, heard, some of, heard some of our colleagues today talk about uh, things like soil fertility, uh, which helps to store carbon in the soil. Uh, and what we've and what we've seen um, across the region over the last, uh, you know, sort of few decades is this incredibly high rate of deforestation, uh, which has meant that the region has moved to a net, uh, that the forests have moved to a net source of emissions. Um, and as we saw in the scenarios presented by uh, uh, Ibu, Ibu Alin, uh, in, the, in the case of Indonesia, you could see that transition from uh, forest and the land use sector being a net source of emissions to a net sink. And finally, blue carbon ecosystems, also mentioned by several of my colleagues, are a key um, natural carbon sink for many ASEAN countries. The region has some of the richest uh, blue carbon reserves uh, or stores in the world. Um, and in addition to um, the ways that decarbonisation can be achieved, I think one of the most exciting and interesting opportunities for Southeast Asia is the green economic opportunity that can be seized. And so this graph uh, ranks countries uh, according to their level of innovation, which is the vertical axis, uh, and also their export competitiveness, which is the horizontal axis. axis. And uh, what you can see in the centre there is that Asia overall is, uh, has you know, sort of this overall comparative advantage in low carbon technology uh, manufacture and export. And this is really driven by those three low carbon uh, technology leaders, uh, South Korea, China, and Japan. But what you can also see is that developing Asia is right on the cusp of competitiveness. And so where I should just say, where you wanna be on this graph is right up in that top right hand uh, corner of the box there. Um, so developing Asia is right on the cusp of competitiveness. And of course, what we know, minute. thank you. The, 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 the challenge that we have here um, will require huge investment in low carbon technologies uh, across the world over the next 30 years, unprecedented levels of investment. Uh, and the opportunity here that can be seized by Southeast Asia is around uh, the potential to position itself as a manufacturing hub for those low carbon technologies. Uh, so poised on the cusp of competitiveness, really strong trade relations with the low carbon leaders and geographical sort of hub uh, you know, in, the, in the sort of center of the global trading network. So really good opportunities there. But for all the benefits, all the need that we've talked about, the transition just will not happen without significant international support. Um, so the Paris Climate Agreement recognised uh, the urgent need for developed countries to take the lead in reducing, both reducing emissions, but also in providing support uh, through, the, through, through finance, technology and capacity building 
uh, to enable climate mitigation and adaptation in developing countries. And what we've seen to date, the $100 billion climate financing commitment made by developing nations has still not fully materialised. And it in and of itself is not enough. It needs to be met and ramped up. Um, and at the enhanced coordination between SEN member states and development finance institutions will also be really key to unlocking the scale of sustainable finance. And so this could include things like strengthening the participation of DFIs in green bond issuances across ASEAN um, and doing things like restructuring near-term debt uh, to unlock public finance that can then be spent on um, in, you know, infrastructure investments that are SDG and Paris Agreement aligned. And of course, low carbon technology transfers and capacity building are really key um, to securing emissions reductions. And we heard our colleague from Laos talk quite a bit about that. Uh, and I think importantly, this must be built into broader long-term planning processes of international support rather than the ad hoc project by project approach that's uh, predominated to date. Um, ASEAN member states themselves have a really critical role to play in enhancing the enabling environment for investment. Uh, this really focuses a lot around the policy environment and around uh, strengthening market transparency. So things underway like the ASEAN uh, Green Ta Taxonomy for Sustainable Finance are really important and aligning those more closely with the EU is um, sort of the way to go to really enhance that transparency. Uh, and then creating the right policy signals. So long-term net zero targets are a really key first step and then translating those into sectoral targets that signals uh, to the investment community um, on where to invest is, is really important as well. Uh, and then things like refining industry and trade incentives to encourage um, low carbon in, in industries and value chains uh, to emerge and to flourish. And the ASEAN region can capitalise on the key opportunities to fast track the transition and reap the benefits. It has really solid foundations for solving common problems collectively and a clear commitment to sustainable development and climate action. And greater collaboration can accelerate ASEAN's low carbon transition while also facilitating the development of region wide uh, investment priorities. And some of the key opportunities um, that this work identified for regional collaboration, this might be an exhaustive list, but just a few, um, a few ideas, um, are around things like the establishment of a regional specific climate fund, um, establishing a regional carbon market and um, building further uh, increasing the ambition and the scale of the integrated regional power grid uh, that's already underway in, and, and, um, and operating in ASEAN. There's um, further opportunities are likely to exist around blue carbon ecosystems. Um, you know, the, the region has some of the world's largest stocks of blue carbon. And so a really good opportunity to possibly to be a world leader in terms of um, capitalising on that potential and really restoring it and reaping the, the broader benefits. And then finally, I think as Ibu Alin touched on, uh, Indonesia is just about to take over the, or has just taken over the G20. Uh, and this provides ASEAN with a really uh, important platform uh, to progress uh, these key issues that can ensure that the global economic recovery from, um, from the pandemic uh, really focuses on supporting developing countries in the net zero transition. Um, and next year, this project will uh, shift into its second phase. Uh, where our country research teams will, will um, work alongside with key stakeholders uh, and really focus on understanding what a 1.5 degrees aligned pathway would look like in, in their country. Um, and that's it from me. Back to you, Prof. Wing. Oh, thank you, Megan. Uh, a quite a number of questions have come, come in and most of them are questions that could be generalised to all the five countries that are represented here. I will give each of the country rep uh, each of the country representative three minutes to answer the following sets of questions. The three questions that are general could be generalized. Number one is a country like Indonesia is a very large carbon sink because every Southeast Asian country is a tropical forest. Uh, has tropical forest and 
These forests are a storage of great biodiversity. So could you say something for each of your, for your country? What's the adequacy of the financing that was promised in the Paris Treaty? And uh, how much optimism can you have of this financing and transfer of technology happening? The second question that is asked is, each of you talked about a plan that the country has advanced to achieve carbon neutrality. Is there a backup plan if things seem to be off the projected target path? The third question is, what are you, what is each of your team going to do in the near future to help translate your excellent recommendations into a policy agenda, into specific suggestions for the consideration of the government. So for the Cambodian uh, uh, speaker, there's a specific question, which is why did Folu, uh, forest and land you and, and land use jumped so much from 2010 onwards. And for the Malaysian uh, presenter, the question there's a specific question. Burning ammonia produces nitrous gases. So how are you going to control those nitrous gases? I leave it to each of you to allocate your answers to the questions as you see fit, three minutes each. So we start with uh, uh, Ibu Alin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Prof. Wing. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to uh, respond to the question about the uh, challenge uh, to reduce emission from the forest and land use sector. Uh, yes, this is a big challenge for us. Uh, reducing emission in this forestry and land use uh, sector is typically cheaper yeah, than, the, than the energy sector. But the problem is the opportunity cost is higher. <laughs> this is the problem. Uh, because we have uh, so many options uh, to use the uh, forest resource to more profitable use, uh, such as converting forest to plantation or mangrove uh, to shrimp farms yeah, or other coastal development. Uh, and these forest use and land use sectors have a certain degree of public good features, yeah, uh, which is, uh, I think, much, uh, much uh, more rely on public funding rather than uh, private financing. Uh, but we have the opportunity yeah, to gain benefit uh, from carbon credit yeah, if uh, we want. Uh, but we have actually unpleasant uh, experience that we cannot get the payment from uh, Norway due to uh, MRFP problem. So in the future, this kind of result-based payment uh, need to be more clear uh, to increase the credibility of this instrument and can incentivize uh, poor and middle-income country to preserve uh, the forest, peat, as well as mangrove. Uh, the other opportunity, uh, maybe uh, to optimize uh, financing for adaptation, uh, that may, uh, might solve uh, two problems at the same time, social problem, particularly poverty and the climate resilience. And uh, we should uh, push uh, international community uh, to, through uh, international negotiation on climate. So the voice of developing countries, uh, which share the same problem, need to be heard. And uh, we should actively involve in the global, uh, global uh, climate negotiation for financing, technology transfer, technology a technical support and investment for green industrialization for decarbonization. Uh, I think that's all uh, from me. Thank you, Ibu. Now we have uh, Dr. Pisaf Kyo. Answer any of, give oh, you, uh, you answer the questions. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, there are four questions. Uh, and so let me try to uh, answer the first, uh, the, the one question directly. Uh, to, uh, to Cambodia with regard to FLU, uh, FLU uh, why the greenhouse gas emission increased sharply from 2010. It's uh, because of the uh, policies on agricultural uh, uh, development, conversion of uh, 
uh, primary forest into the uh, uh, crops, uh, what called cash, cash crops. And that uh, trend has reduced actually from uh, 2016 on because the Cambodia stopped issuing the economic land compensation to convert primary forest into the uh, or forest area into the uh, agricultural uh, cropland uh, projects. So the trade of deforestation have uh, declined over the years, but uh, we haven't really had data to uh, make up yet. We, we're still being analyzed on that part. So that the uh, uh, answer to the uh, questions. And if you look at uh, on the uh, financial uh, plans uh, uh, for forestry sectors, as uh, uh, Prof. Alin already mentioned, it's uh, largely from uh, public investment. And, but uh, we also have some donor project, even in small. Uh, it, uh, this area is still challenging for sustainable forest management and protection, but we also received some uh, assistance on the, uh, uh, for finance and technology, uh, technology transfer. Uh, so we also adopting and applying some technology like smart monitoring into forest protection, and it has been uh, helpful as well. And for the uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, monitoring and evaluation using technology ha has also been uh, helpful, even though the rate of uh, transfer is uh, slow, but it's uh, it positive, I mean, break, uh, gradual uh, progress. And, into, uh, and also the uh, for forest protection, there are also areas of opportunity that we can look at through the sustainable financing from payment for ecosystem services, uh, charging, uh, a user, especially for corporate, uh, to uh, to pay for their ecosystem services, for example, water use uh, uh, being protected by the forest, uh, uh, forest upstream, for example, or we can also generate um, uh, from tourism as well. Or tourism can also be one of source of the uh, 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 source of uh, in, uh, finance, and also sustainable uh, uh, forestry can also be a source of uh, financial support for forest sector. And for in terms of the plan, to me, uh, the question is, is there a backup plan? Uh, it's still 30 years to go. Do you want to have, have uh, do you want to have a backup plan? To me, uh, uh, it's more about uh, um, applying the plan, turn it into the activity first and see five years or 10 years, whether it goes uh, on the right track or it's already off track. And then you can do the, uh, what we call evalu uh, do the monitoring and evaluation and then try to adjust rather than saying, oh, we better have a plan now. Uh, <laughs> there's always risk, right? We haven't uh, implemented the plan, why would we need a uh, backup plan anyway? So it's still a long way to go. And a few points uh, for Cambodia, it's still a voluntary and more ASEAN country, it's a voluntary uh, to go for decarbonization. So the priority is adaptations, but the uh, as long as the mitigation measure is uh, supportive or in a, a, a complement the uh, development plan. I think uh, we better, uh, the government should be encouraged to follow and uh, uh, implement the mitigation plan. And also, of course, the achievement of the plan, it also um, largely uh, depend on the financial assistance from developed country and technology transfer, of course, and also the collaboration from private sector as well. So there are different factors. We cannot just uh, put the a blame or burdens on the individual country because it's a more sort of a like common responsibility with a multi-stakeholder participation. Uh, so that pretty much uh, I would like to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Popek? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wu. It's a very difficult question to answer, but I, I, I will try. Um, the question number one is, is about um, the, the financing in the forestry program, um, in Laos is um, this is the 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 lack, lackest, uh, the financing um, um, that that we uh, receive from the uh, donor in for the forestry sector. But the question is whether the efficient use and productive use of the finance to achieve the target because we plan to have the land cover, uh, uh, forestry cover, uh, 70% in 2020. This is uh, challenging. Uh, we could not achieve that. Uh, second question about the plan. We don't, I think we don't have the backup plan. We also have the plan. But the problem of the plan is, is about the implementation of the plan. There's mechanism, connecting, 
uh, implemented monitoring, that is a uh, very um, challenge and uh, questionable. Uh, the last one, how we help transfer the policy maker, what we do in our agenda. Uh, it's also a very difficult question to answer, but um, in, in the case of Laos, we're thinking that the government is just like a partner in doing the research and involving them in the beginning and uh, learning from them, uh, trying to understand each other. Uh, we, uh, in academia also, we don't know on the mechanism behind that. Um, in my experience, in former minister of the natural resource and uh, environment, he was very active and uh, we, we have very good discussion and he seeking a lot of the uh, comment and suggestion from the researcher from university. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Popet. Uh, Yun Yong? Okay, the first question concerns burning ammonia leading to nitrous oxide production. Uh, it does raise concern about an increase in nitrous oxide emissions, and I do not know how it can be avoided at the moment. The demonstration at the Japanese uh, Chogoku Electric Power Corporation's uh, commercial 120 megawatts power coal power station in 2017 demonstrated that it is possible to keep nitrous oxide within the usual limits and to avoid any ammonia slip into exhaust gas. Higher blending shares of up to 20% ammonia in energy terms might be feasible with only minor adjustments to a coal power plant. The second question concerns what technology or process will be used to generate green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is produced by splitting water using electricity generated from low carbon sources. Third, I would like to respond to Stephen Hall's question and Mooney's comments. Composting practices improves carbon sequestration, water efficiency, agricultural productivity, food security, farmers' income, national health, and it will lower, it will lower levels of indebtedness of, for, for farmers and promote rather than ravage biodiversity in the soil on the farm. A plantation company cannot transform its relationship with the soil everywhere at once. What they can use, usefully do is focus on the nurseries growing new seedlings and the planting out of new seedlings, especially in when they are replanting old plantations. What they can do is focus on changing the mindset and regenerating their attitude towards soil and their relationship with it, developing the science and their understanding of the whole soil palm ecosystem and rejuvenating the soil and their plantations and their skills and managerial approach as a coherent integrated strategic policy for the 2020s. The last question concerns decarbonizing transport in Malaysia. Malaysia does not have an automotive policy that eventually bans vehicles powered by fossil fuels. The National Automotive Policy 2020 promotes energy efficient vehicles, which are based on internal combustion engines. The categorization of electric vehicles in Malaysia is also bundled with hybrids and internal combustion engine vehicles that have connectivity and autonomous features. The Malaysian government gives priority to the development of energy efficient vehicles and to support environmentally friendly mobility initiatives. That's all from me. Uh, back to you, Professor Wu. Megan, would you like to comment? Uh, very quickly, because I can see we're at time. Um, 
I think I just wanted to add a comment uh, on the on the idea of a backup plan. Um, and, and really to say um, that although the net zero goal is 2050, we really have the next 10 years uh, to, to, to avoid uh, exceeding 1.5 degrees. It really is that stark. Um, you think about us as being the Titanic barreling towards a, um, an iceberg and we have to slam the brakes on now. And then once we've stopped, we can turn around and, and sort of start to head back in the right direction. Um, so it's a huge challenge and, and I think that can't be understated. We, you, you can't sort of think, we, oh, we can sort of, you know, we can go faster later. We actually all have to go as fast as we possibly can now. Um, but I think, you know, in, in addition to the enormous challenge that that presents, and it, it is huge, huge challenge, uh, it also comes with huge opportunities. Um, you know, economic growth potential, as I touched on in the region through uh, low carbon technology manufacturing, socioeconomic development, uh, just through the breadth of actions that are needed. Um, you know, we, we need you know, huge amounts of reforestation and, and landscape restoration. We need uh, manufacturing jobs. We need resource jobs. You know, it, it, it's, the, it's the full gamut of, of opportunities there. Um, as well as obviously really significant environmental benefits to stop the catastrophic biodiversity loss that we're also experiencing at the moment. Um, so I think it's really important to think about this as a, as a huge challenge, uh, but one that if we do this well, it solves, it can, you know, it can solve so many complex challenges, um, you know, in, in, in the way that we sort of move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, let me thank STSN for organizing this uh, panel. And most of all, I'd like to express my thanks to the five presenters for sharing with us their brilliant insights on the Titanic rolling towards the ice. But we will work on just as our love would go on, as you are told in the song. So thank you very much. Have a good day. And Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice Bye. day. Thank you.